All right. Thank you. Friday. So it's a bit of a difficult day for you, probably. The last, the last day, you're all sad about the school ending. And you had friends. Le- Hopefully nobody was left on the slopes, right? I believe nobody and no parts of anybody. All right. Great. So we're all here. Today, I'm going to talk about something that is... Um, not explicitly supersymmetry, but there's a supersymmetry story and a supersymmetry uh, connection to everything I, um, I say here. Supersymmetry is a framework where you can sort of take anything and then supersymmetrize it. Uh, but it's a topic that is motivated from communing with, uh, with string theory for a little while. If you, uh, if you think about model building within string theory, any kind of approach, um, any kind of string phenomenology approach, you frequently get many diff- many states that are beyond the standard model states. And, and the word hidden sector that I'm using here is defined in a really simple way. It is a collection of states or sectors that do not have internal quantum numbers uh, shared with the standard model. So that's what I mean by hidden, hidden sectors. And if you model builds, you might get thousands of particles that uh, have different symmetries in the standard model. You might have millions. You might, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you are attempting to make the standard model in string theory, but you generally get a whole lot more than you bargain for. And standard model states plus extra stuff. So in this lecture, I would like to uh, tell you a phenomenologist's view of these hidden sectors. So I'm, I'm inspired by your efforts and all these hidden sectors. And now I want to think, how can I go about uh, uh, discovering them at the LHC or at other, uh, other facilities? This is an extremely difficult problem. If you don't share quantum numbers with our ordinary standard model states, you're uh, you can't make them very easily. Gravitationally, they couple, but gravitationally, there's no, there's no uh, g- graviton-induced collisions at the LHC unless there's large extra dimensions. So um, there has to be a better way. And it turns out that, 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 that the way might be through Higgs bosons. And so I want to try to uh, explain that. So first... Let me give you one slide brief introduction to uh, to the Higgs. You're all familiar with it, but I just have to remind you and get our nomenclature set. Higgs boson is an SU2 doublet. There is a uh, three fields, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, that uh, can be thought of as the longitudinal components of the W and Z boson. Uh, and, and massless or massless, massless Goldstone bosons associated with the SU2 symmetry breaking. And uh, there's a physical state Higgs, uh, H and the vacuum expectation value V. And we know that the vacuum expectation value is 246 GeV because, that, uh, because we know the mass of the W and Z bosons. Uh, so... The, lo- the transverse components of the W and Z combine with these Goldstone bosons to give you the full uh, multiplets for the W and Z, the massive W and Z multiplets, transverse and longitudinal components. And then the Lagrangian of this remaining physical degree of freedom, Higgs, um, is set here. And the Higgs mass is the only free parameter in this whole entire game now. In the standard model, it's the only one. Uh, it's equivalent to that phi to the fourth coupling lambda being the free parameter. The interaction of the Higgs boson is, uh, is uniquely specified by this kind of uh, uh, multiplication, 1 plus h over the VEB squared, multiplied by these mass terms of W and Z, and then 1 plus h over V uh, multiplied by the fermion bilinear operator with its uh, corresponding mass term. So the interaction of the Higgs boson with standard model states is proportional to, uh, to that state's mass. Okay, so you all knew that. <laughs> so now let's ask, uh, what, is, uh, what is very special about the Higgs boson in the standard model? 
And you'll hear the statements that it gives elementary particles their masses, which is, of course, correct. Um, it has not been found yet, which is technically correct as of today, but maybe not in a short period of time. Maybe the 125 GeV Higgs uh, sig signal will, will maintain. Uh, you'll hear that it's the only fundamental Lorentz scalar particle in nature. So there's this, these quadratic divergences associated with the scalar uh, particles, quantum corrections, and that's the reason why we invoked the symmetries of, uh, of, 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 of supersymmetry. Uh, that's why people will invoke extra dimension ideas. So lots of different um, uh, implications of being the only fundamental scalar particle in nature. And it condenses. So it gets a vacuum expectation value. So that's, all these are, are unique uh, aspects of the Higgs boson in the standard model. All these reasons are true, of course. Uh, but there, there's another reason why the Higgs boson is very special, which of course is related to all of them in a deep way. It's the, uh, it's the only gauge invariant, Lorentz invariant, relevant operator uh, in the standard model, the H dagger H operator. It's the only one. And the, and the term relevant is a technical term in effective field theory parlance. Relevant means that dimensionality is less than four, the operator. If the operator dimensionality is four, it's marginal. If the operator dimensionality is greater than four, it's an irrelevant operator. So the only relevant operator in the standard model that's gauge invariant and Lorentz invariant is H squared, H dagger H. There are other relevant operators that are gauge invariant and even Lorentz invariant uh, that you can think of depending on your definition of the standard model. But this one right here, this is the hypercharged field strength tensor. It's in gauge invariant all by itself. Uh, it's dimension two. But the, uh, the problem is it has uh, hanging Lorentz indices on it, so it's not Lorentz invariant, so you can't just write down a B in the Lagrangian. You have to attach it with Lorentz indices. There's another relevant operator one can form, which is the Higgs with the lepton doublet. That is, uh, that's dimension three, but the, uh, the, the problem with that is that uh, its Lorentz spinner index is hanging off of it. This, spin, this is dimension three halves, excuse me. It has a Lorentz spinner index hanging off of it. So it's uh, not uh, uh, relativistic invariant all on its own. And then here we have um, V, uh, I, I said this wrong, I think I heard a whisper. I get dimensionality three halves plus one. Sorry. Okay, this is gauge invariant and uh, relevant operator and Lorentz invariant all in one. And this is the right handed neutrino mass operator. So V right uh, transpose I sigma two V right. So depending on your definition of the standard model, this may, may be in or out of the standard model. Uh, I like, I sort of like to think of it as part of the standard model. But there's a whole effective field theory story behind this. This is, this is also very special compared to that. And this very special operator we think of likely has a coefficient which is a very high scale. It's unlikely that the coefficient of this operator, if indeed we have right-handed neutrinos like this, that its coefficient would be M weak. In fact, it's a very high mass, and that is what sets the seesaw mechanism. It's the, it's the heavy lever arm on the seesaw mechanism in neutrino physics. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is way up there in mass with a, with a right-handed neutrino uh, co mass coefficient to it. And this is the expectation of effective field theories when you have these relevant operators is that the coefficient mass should be roughly the cutoff scale of the theory or some, some high scale of theory that could be protected. But, and if it's lower than that, it has to be protected or explained by some symmetry. This is the reason why the coefficient of H dagger H is so bizarrely small in the standard model and why we worry about it 
is uh, the analog in neutrino physics says it should be very, very heavy. And H dagger H, it should be very, very heavy. But instead, it's light, it's around the weak scale, and then we invoke supersymmetry or extra dimensions or something like that to explain it. All right. So that's a, that's a brief aside. Nevertheless, it's the only relevant operator, uh, gauge invariant, Lorentz invariant operator in the standard model. And what does this have to do with, um, with anything? Well, let me remind you about how difficult it is to find new physics at, uh, at high energy colliders. And this is one of the reasons why it's, new difficult, why it's difficult. The, the standard model, matter and gauge states saturate dimensionality of the Lagrangian. There are, there's kinetic terms with the gauge, uh, uh, gauge connection here, with the gauge field uh, interacting with the psi dagger psi. There's uh, the gauge kinetic functions here. There's interactions with the Higgs. There's all these other interactions of normal standard model states that have dimension four. And the gauge couplings are dimensionless because it's dimension four coupling, uh, dimension four operator. Any new states that couple in uh, may come with a very large suppression scale. There's nothing to say that, that uh, the interaction strength of standard model states with some new states would be uh, coupled like one over some very small scale. It's very likely to be some, some cutoff scale. So if you have new states, they don't really talk to each other in any way. Uh, at the renormalizable level, non-renormalizable level, you have some one over large scale. This is extremely difficult to find evidence for at a collider. Any kind of higher dimensional operator type approach to looking for physics beyond the standard model that don't violate sacrosanct symmetries, like, like a baryon number or something like that, or, um, are difficult to find at a collider. You have to go to the energy, more or less the energies of lambda, uh, to, uh, to see it. So, but there are opportunities to see new physics things with the Higgs boson. This, this relevant operator, H squared, gives us a chance to see new states at the renormalizable level. Generic couplings of the Higgs to standard model states or hidden, hidden sector states are uh, scalars, would be H squared and then there's some hidden sector squared with a dimensionless coefficient in front. So we have this opportunity to see these hidden sector states here by that coupling. Likewise, uh, this, this is quite generic with any scalars running around. Uh, if you had new gauge bosons, abelian gauge bosons, then you should expect a, uh, this coupling, the bottom uh, coupling, x mu nu, b mu nu. That coupling is gauge invariant. This has to be uh, a U1 of the new, th if, you if you have an SUN in the hidden sector, it's not going to couple like this because an SUN field strength tensor has a hanging gauge index on it, so it's not gauge invariant on its own, but an extra U1 is, and that can couple to hypercharge. So if you have your favorite models or favorite theories that have U extra U1s lying around everywhere, then you need to be concerned about or think about the interaction of that U1 with hypercharge. And that will disrupt the standard model. It will disrupt phenomenology, and, uh, but maybe not, um, dis but, but still will be uh, allowed today. All right, so why should we uh, expect more stuff? Now, in this audience, I don't have to really explain that in a too forceful manner because you're, you're very much used to the idea of a lot more things than the standard model. But we should back up for a moment and, and really think hard about what it is that we have been studying for the last century in particle physics. And, and what we've been studying for the last century is really just our bodies and nothing more. We've, we've, uh, there's electrons in here, and there's protons, and there's neutrons in here. And uh, in those protons, there was an up quark and a down quark, and we discovered that. And then we looked at, uh, and then we well, made colliders go high, higher and higher energy. And then we found a copy of what's in our body. So there was a copy of an electron, which was a muon, another copy of the electron, which was a tau, 
We found the copies of the up quarks and copies of the down quarks, but it's all just our body with slightly different masses. These so it's really, it's really the only thing that we've uh, that, that we've studied, and uh, so it's a very very human centric uh, vision of science is to think that the only thing that's out there is uh, is uh, is our bodies. So uh, and and of course, from the cosmologists will say, ah, yeah, we're we're, we're nothing. Right, um, we, we're for, for less than four percent of the universe. Uh, things that make up our body. So the cosmologists know that well. Uh, dark matter is uh, some substantial fraction of the universe, and dark energy. Um, so we really should expect, as uh, Shakespeare said, said that there's more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our standard model philosophy. So. But, but then the question, I, I think we'd all agree with that, perhaps. Uh, but then why should it be around, around our scale? Why should these new particles be around, uh, around 100 GeV? Well, there's, there's no definitive statement about, about that. Uh, new physics that tries to protect the Higgs boson is around the, uh, is around the weak scale. In the supersymmetric context, the, the reason why we had the weak scale around the weak scale is that supersymmetry breaking transmitted supersymmetry uh, breaking effects to particles and gave them mass around the TeV scale, around the weak scale. And that same supersymmetry breaking mechanism can give uh, gravity-mediated masses to other particles, not just the standard model particles, with mass around the TeV scale. Uh, extra dimensions, if it's suppressing mass scales in some uniform warped, uh, warped way, it can, it can do that to other sectors. So there's, there's uh, many reasons and many approaches by which one can imagine that this definitive scale in nature that we don't know the origin of can have many different sectors be tied to it. So we have the standard model tied to the, to the weak scale, uh, because it's tied to supersymmetry breaking or some other mechanism, likewise hidden sectors. And there's, there's uh, the weakest way I could say it is that there's really no strong reason to believe the standard model is alone at the weak scale. All right, so, so there's, there's a myriad of possibilities of what could be at the weak scale. So let's, uh, let's take a, a very simple one that can illustrate the scalar interaction term and the, uh, the U1 uh, mixing term and what that will do to phenomenology if indeed it exists. Either one or both of those terms um, exist in, in the weak scale uh, physics world. So the simplest theory is a hidden sector abelian Higgs model. And, and it's, a, it's very, very simple. It's one complex scalar field charged under a U1, symmetry, U1 gauge symmetry, and it uh, condenses, has a vacuum expectation value. And so the symmetry is broken, and the gauge, this extra U1, has a gauge, uh, uh, gauge boson mass of around whatever, the weak scale or, or TeV scale. Okay, so that is our simplest, simplest theory. And uh, what, what impact would that have on our world? All right, so this, in, in purple boxes, I think, I think that color is purple, uh, this is how it affects our world, only in two ways, and no other way. There's, in, the, in this, the kinetic energy of this X boson, this X boson is this, is this new U1 gauge boson, there's a kinetic energy term all by itself in its own world, but then it connects to hypercharged gauge boson through this kinetic mixing term. And the coefficient is dimensionless, it's chi, and, uh, and I have to write it down. So I write it down. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's gauge invariant, so there's no reason that it should not be there. Likewise, there is a, a, Hig, a Higgs Lagrangian where the standard model states have their kinetic terms and they have their self-interactions. The hidden sector states have their kinetic terms, their masses, their self-interactions, but whoop, there's an interaction right here in this purple box, which is the, the standard model state and the hidden sector state squared 
with this kappa, this dimensionless coupling kappa in front. And it's this t these two boxes, that's it. That's, uh, that's how you're going to find, have any chance at all to uh, communicate with this, with this world. So if you have kinetic mixing like this, it's a, it's a funny thing in the, in the uh, kinetic terms. Uh, so you, you do, uh, the best way to approach it calculational-wise is to first rotate it into a canonical kinetic term basis. Judici there's, there's an infinite number of ways to do it, but this is a judicious way because ultimately this X field will be the one that has the highest mass, and so there's, there's this approach to doing it. This, uh, this makes gauge can, uh, canonical gauge kinetic terms, but then the mixing introduces an interaction of this X field, this new gauge boson in a hidden sector. It interacts with ordinary standard model states via their hypercharge. So this coupling constant, the, the hypercharge seeps in from this kinetic mixing, and the, the coupling strength is the hypercharge coupling strength times the hypercharge of the, say, fermion, and eta, eta is uh, proportional to the gauge kinetic mixing term, xi. It's actually xi over one, square root of one minus xi squared, but if xi is small, then it's just, it's just that gauge kinetic uh, value. So we have a chance to see it through this. We have a chance to interact with this heavier state. But we have to be careful because uh, it's extremely dangerous to start mixing new gauge bosons with the standard model gauge bosons. Uh, just a tiny bit of mixing and uh, precision electro weak observables go off very, very quickly. So, uh, so let's be slightly more technical. Um, you can do this as an exercise at home if you, uh, or on the plane if you, if you would like. But uh, this is the ordinary weak mixing angle cosine of the weak mixing angle here, sine of the weak mixing angle. This is a new mixing angle, tangent theta alpha, which is proportional to the gauge kinetic mixing. So if the gauge kinetic mixing were zero, then, this, then the cosines would be, uh, I think that works out, right? Yes. If this were zero, then the sines are zero. So these off-diagonal terms here are zero. And all you get is the ordinary two by two matrix of the weak mixing angle matrix between the photon and the z, z boson. And then you have all by itself the z prime. Sometimes I go between x and z prime for the new, the new gauge boson, so just, just to warn you about that. But if this kinet gauge kinetic mixing is non-zero, then you get a mixture of all of these in there. You start playing around with um, photon Z and Z prime masses mixing each other, you, you really have a problem. If you look at this carefully, you see that there still is a, a massless eigenstate. Uh, you need that. And, there's, and, and of course, you're guaranteed to have that because, because uh, the symmetries that were broken by this extra field were not enough to break the remaining U1 electromagnetic. So there's still going to be a massless state a massless gauge boson state in the spectrum, despite the complicated uh, matrix here. And that massless state you identify with the photon. The, uh, and, and in fact, you can normalize it in such, in such a way that it's exactly the photon with the electric charge and so on. Then you have the Z and the Z prime, and the mixing between these two massive states uh, becomes an issue. Now, uh, if you, re if you recall, let me, uh, we'll, we'll say a word or two about the precision lecture week in just a moment. But remember your, your kindergarten days of the standard model, where you learned about the W boson and the Z boson, and they had uh, different masses that were related by sine squared theta W, right? Uh, M MZ squared uh, times cosine squared theta W is equal to MW squared, plus some small radiative corrections. Now, imagine you have some, the Z is in a matrix with another Z, a Z prime, and it's mixing, and it's doing a, le a level repulsion. 
But the W is not being affected at all. The W has its, has its own mass matrix, its own mass eigenvalue that's not disturbed at all by any, anything that we've said. But you're level repulsing the Z by this type of interaction. When you do that, you're disrupting that connection between the weak, between the charge current and the neutral current uh, interactions. And that is the origin, really, of the, of the problem for for, for precision electroweak uh, when you mix these new states in. Okay, so, now before I talk about, yeah, so I, I'll do that. So before I talk about the precision electroweak on these different sectors, I, I, I need to tell you about the Higgs boson. So the Higgs has this one extra coupling, and now instead of just having a standard model Higgs state, I have two mass eigenstates, little h and capital H. And for the purposes of this lecture, the, cap the little h is going to be mostly standard model because I'm going to assume a small mixing just uh, for reasons that you'll see, a somewhat small mixing. So the, so the Higgs h is, a, is mostly a standard model Higgs. And I will write down that it's cosine h times standard model Higgs minus sine h times this hidden sector Higgs. And then there's a heavier mass eigenstate, which is sine Higgs, so that's nearly zero. Standard model plus cosine hidden sector. Uh, yeah, so... Okay, so in case you... Uh, so this is, a, this is about one. And this is about zero, the sign, the sign for, for most of what I will say. And the, the mixing angle is proportional to kappa, the VEV of one Higgs, and the VEV of the other Higgs. So both Higgs need VEVs, and you need a mixing. And, and if you don't have any of those three, then you get no, uh, no mixing between them. But that is uh, to be understood and expected. Okay, so, so now instead of a standard model Higgs, I have a Higgs boson that it's close to the standard model plus another Higgs boson that is coupling to the standard model just, uh, just a little bit. These are the new, these are the new Feynman rules. Uh, they have cosine, instead of just two times mw squared over v for the Higgs coupling to ww, I have a cosine h in front. So it's nearly one, but, that's, but not exactly one. And uh, these, are, these are the Feynman rules for, this, for the, the lightest Higgs. And the Higgs to fermion fermion has a cosine H out in front. All of them, they have these cosine H out in front. But then, I, but then I also have the chance of this little Higgs coupling to a ZZ prime. And that ZZ prime will be, uh, uh, has various interactions that, uh, that are sort of complicated. But you can uh, read about them there, cosine, cosine Higgs and sine, uh, sine H. All right. Now, kinetic mixing origin. So I, I said uh, just a few slides ago that I can write down X mu nu, B mu nu with impunity because it's gauge invariant. And if you're an effective field theorist, you just have to write it down. But what you may find in your studies is that, uh, that it's, di that it's uh, diagonal at some scale, meaning there is no uh, gauge kinetic mixing at, say, the Planck scale or at a gut scale. Um, but it gets induced. It gets induced. So, so that, that could be a circumstance, all right? If you find that that is the circumstance in your theory, then... There can be other states in the theory, fermionic or, or otherwise, with vector bosons. You have a charge here under that vector boson and a charge here under the other vector boson. And uh, this loop here induces a kinetic mixing. And that is uh, proportional to the char charge x times charge y times the logarithm of the, um, of the masses. And there's a one-loop factor out in front, of course. So typically, you, 
if, if you have the sort of your theories born diagonal and then quantum corrections uh, are induced, uh, you frequently get the case where the description of the theory is, is uh, nicely formulated as two gauge bosons, massive gauge bosons with a small kinetic mixing between them, and then you can re-diagonalize that at the low scale after you do re your renormalization group flow. Okay, so a one-loop effect. A one-loop effect is oftentimes a few, a few percent. Okay, so kinetic mixing of a few percent. That's just to give you a rough feel for it. All right. So here is a precision electroweak effects of kinetic mixing. So uh, obviously I, I told you heuristically what this uh, would be. It's the level repulsion of the Z with respect to the Z prime. Uh, but you can think of it as also... For example, uh, a, a kinetic mixing interaction of the Z decaying into fermions, and then you have a, an insertion into a Z prime, and then it decays into FF bar. That is disrupting things. Uh, it's also disruptive to, to the W mass. It's, it's disruptive to the W mass because of how the full precision electroweak program uh, fits in. Uh, Okay, so uh, the data limits suggest that this quantity, eta over 10%, so this is the kinetic mixing over 10% squared, times 250 over mx, this is the, the new z prime mass squared, this whole thing needs to be less than 1. And it's not terribly difficult to make that less than 1. Um, I think with the recent analyses, with the W mass getting better, with, uh, with the top quark mass uh, measurement getting better, because there's some uncertainties associated with the top quark mass in there, that this, it's, it's slightly better than this, but not much. Okay, so now, I have this small amount of kinetic mixing. I know with the kinetic mixing, remember, makes my X, my new gauge boson, interact with fermionic states proportional to its hypercharge. So I can look for this at the LHC. And this is after 100 inverse femtobarns looking for uh, lepton production, so Drelyan lepton production through a Z prime, a massive Z prime. And this is the significance of, uh, of the signal. Uh, if you're below here, it's undetectable. If you're above here, you have at least four, in, in the yellow, you have at least four sigma significance for the signal. So this is completely undetectable at the LHC. And you see that eta being less than a few percent, less than about three percent, means no matter what you do, you won't find it. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an, it's an unfortunate um, aspect of... Uh, of these theories is extremely difficult to find, but with lots of luminosity and lots of attempts, you can, uh, you can find the, uh, the Z prime. So now Higgs in precision electroweak. So now I have, I'll, sh I'll show you one di two diagrams. Well, yeah, one diagram. Here's just one diagram. The Z, Higgs, fermion, fermion, right? So, in the standard model, you take this into account, along with lots of other diagrams, right? The, Z, the Higgs comes out of here, and then the Higgs can go across here. So there's lots of diagrams in the standard model. But now, I have two Higgs bosons, which have mixing angles associated with them. So this, this one diagram in the standard model turns to cosine H there, cosine H there, uh, for, for little h, and then sine H here, sine H there, for capital H. And so in the standard model, this, the constraint of precision electroweak used to be log of MH uh, is 1.93, plus or minus this. And now it's sort of well approximated by cosine squared log plus sine squared log of the heavier mass. It has to be less than that. 
So it's relatively easy to get high mass Higgs when mixing angle is, is small. There's, uh, so if this, if this angle is very small, then this Higgs mass can be very, very heavy. It can be over a TeV if the mixing angle is small. If this mixing angle is order one, then if you have a Higgs mass of a TeV, then the logarithm gives you much greater than, than two, and you're in violation of precision electroweak data. And then uh, sort of related to that is perturbative um, unitarity of longitudinal W scattering. So this is one more diagram that I will write down. So the W's uh, can inter longitudinal W's can interact in many different ways. And their amplitudes, their partial wave amplitudes, demonstrate at tree level, at perturbative level, a violation of unitarity, probability being greater than one, uh, if, this, if the Higgs boson is greater than about 700 or 800 GeV. Uh, and it's because this, this coupling is growing very fast. The Higgs coupling to longitudinal states is growing very fast in, with, with energy and uh, uh, with mass. So you need to, uh, it's constrained to be less than about 800 GeV. So if I start adding new Higgs boson with very heavy mass to the spectrum, does this affect longitudinal W scattering? And the answer is it does, uh, and, it, and it restricts what the heavy Higgs mass can be with respect to the light Higgs mass. Okay, so let's assume that the light Higgs mass is 125 GeV. Then, if the, if the angle, this is the same as sine h, but this is sine w squared. If the angle is really large, then, uh, then you have to be less than 700 GeV. So that's really the standard model limit. So when the angle is very, very large, it's effectively saying that this is the standard model Higgs and this is the very weakly coupled exotic Higgs. And then the limit is 700 GeV. If the angle is very, very small, 0 to 0.1, sine squared of the angle is 0 to 0.1, then I can go up to several TeV without a problem. And the unitarity violations do not kick in because the mixing angle is, is just too small. The coupling is too small to affect it. So this is another reason why I'm going to suggest that we have a new Higgs state that is rather heavy uh, with a small mixing with the standard model. Okay. Trans-TEV Higgs state, let's call it. How could, you, how could you find such a state, a trans-TEV Higgs boson? Now this is, um, if, if, you, if you hear a standard model talk and, then, and somebody says, I, this, is how, this is how you would find the standard model Higgs boson with mass greater than a TEV, just stop listening and, and, and leave. Because, uh, because the, there's, there's no understanding of the, of the coupling or the width of the standard model. It's not a, it's not a respectable particle at a TEV, the standard model Higgs. It's, if you do a naive computation of its width, its width is much greater than its mass. So there's no, uh, it's no, no particle to speak of. So now here I'm talking about the prospect of a Higgs boson mass that's greater than a TEV. Well, how can, how can that be? And it's because its couplings to the standard model states are very, very low. Uh, maybe 10%, maybe 5% of, of normal standard model strength, their couplings. So the, uh, the width is very much controlled by those small couplings. And so it is, it is a respectable particle. It has a resonance. It's, it can be produced. So when, but when that coupling goes smaller and smaller then a, a very good thing happens and a very bad thing happens. Okay, so the bad news is that your production cross-section goes to zero as that coupling goes to zero. So you, so you lose out that way. The good news is that, uh, that the width of the state gets more narrow. So it's a very respectable narrow width particle. So uh, I'm going to emphasize this first part 
we're going to look for a, a heavy Higgs boson, trans-TEV Higgs boson at the LHC uh, with a narrow width and a small coupling. And how, would you, how would you go about doing that? Uh, here's a, in a paper I wrote a few years ago with uh, some colleagues, uh, Yano Tsui and Matt Bowen. We had several sort of benchmark points to, to demonstrate this. And here's one that I'll emphasize, point C, the sine squared theta. So this is this, is this small coupling. So, so we're talking about the heavy Higgs here. The heavy Higgs has a tiny bit of standard model in it. This sine squared is point 0.1. So it has a tiny bit of standard model Higgs in it. So it couples to the standard model, standard model states. So that's what that means. The light Higgs is 120 GeV. So it's almost enti- this light Higgs is almost entirely standard model Higgs. And, and you'll find it just like a standard model Higgs. There will be no, no difference whatsoever. Uh, a 10% change in a production cross-section means nothing with respect to the LHC because of QCD corrections are at least that large. So, so what you'll find is you will find this just like a standard model Higgs and nobody will say a thing about it. And it will just... Uh, in fact, people could be depressed and say, oh, that's the only thing we ever found is this standard model Higgs boson, and that's the it, that's it, and nothing else. But now there's this, there's this extra state in the spectrum, 1.1 TeV, and it has, as I say, a tiny coupling to the standard model. There is a, the, the prospect of this heavy Higgs decaying into light Higgs, but that, but that branching fraction is less than 10% in this case. There's actually frequently in parameter space where the branching fraction is rather small. Um, so it's, it's an opportunity, but it's, it's uh, rarely a dominant um, decay mechanism. So we have to find this Higgs through normal kinds of Higgs search processes. And one of the best ways to do it is to produce the Higgs boson. So this is, this is how, you, how you produce it. The biggest way to produce it is glue, glue, through a top cork, and you produce the Higgs. This is the heavy Higgs, right there. You can also produce it through vector boson uh, fusion, electroweak vector boson fusion. Uh, so both of those are considered. Uh, in fact, uh, the dominant one is through the vector boson fusion, like this. Uh, so W, W, heavy Higgs. And this forms a jet at high pseudo-rapidity. So the protons coming from that direction, other protons coming from that direction, it, they release W bosons, and then they deflect a quark a little bit. As they release the W boson, they deflect a quark just a little bit off path. W bosons interact and make a Higgs centrally, and the quarks screen by and make jets at very high angles in the detector. And so they, de- they tag those jets. They have to be greater than 100 GeV, and they have to have pseudo-rapidity greater than 2. So that, that angle is, a, is, is very close to the beam angle when pseudo-rapidity is that high of 2. So this is, this is a way to do it. And, uh, and, you want to make sh- and, and the way we looked at it was assume that one W decays into a lepton and neutrino, and the du- other W decays into two jets. And you do all these criteria, missing energy greater than 100 GeV from that neutrino. Uh, the leptons are central. Uh, the lepton is central. And this, is, this shows you how, how tough this whole game is at the LHC. It's, uh, we're going we're gonna to be having a lot of fun for years at the LHC. Um, so the techniques that we employed were similar to, uh, to some studies of uh, ATLAS and CMS, but for lighter standard model Higgs states. So this is a different kind of scenario, but we use the same, same techniques. And what you do is you assume that the missing energy came from a W, and then you reconstruct what that, mis- that neutrino form momentum is, and then make an invariant mass of the lepton neutrino jet jet. And, and if you had an infinite number of events, or a very high number of events, this is what the signal would look like. And this is what the background looks like. 
And of course, the signal is peaked at the mass, which is 1.1 TeV. Okay, so that looks like a really ex uh, spectacular signal, right? We'd find that uh, no problem. The difficulty is that between 1 and 1 1.3 TeV, so, so if you take this, this energy range, the total number of signal events in that range is 13 with 100 inverse functor bars. 100 inverse, right, right now the LHC7 has accumulated um, about five inverse photo binds. So we have to go a factor of 20 higher uh, at 14 TeV. So this is assuming a 14 TeV collider. And the, and the integral number of uh, background events under here is seven. So you would get, um, so you get sort of random populating of points in this energy range, you would not get a really smooth distribution like this. This, this really smooth distribution requires hundred, hundreds of points. Uh, you'd get sort of some random popcorn popping in, in that region. And you would say, well, there looks like there's more events in this high energy realm of lepton, neutrino, jet, jet than the standard model allows. So we might have something up there. That might be what they initially say. However, the LHC uh, will, uh, is considering and likely will have a luminosity upgrade, a high, lumino high luminosity upgrade, where they'll get thousands of inverse vector barns. But there's additional challenges in that environment, uh, overlapping events and so on, which make this analysis difficult. But one might be able to see evidence for, for a heavy Higgs boson with uh, hundreds of inverse vector barns of data. So people can be depressed for a while, depressed, 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 and then suddenly throw a party uh, because they find evidence. Now, some of you will say, ah, oh, what, this is, uh, you know, these standard, these Higgs, uh, heavy Higgs searches have been going on since time immemorial. Uh, the, the heavy Higgs searches in supersymmetry are well known and they can be up to a TeV. And the reason why they make sense, those heavy Higgs bosons and supersymmetry make sense, is because their couplings to vector bosons also go to zero. Uh, but there's a real difference between this sort of hidden sector type study and supersymmetry heavy Higgs or type one doublet or type two doublet type uh, Higgs searches that have been done in the past. There's a qualitative difference. And that is that uh, the heavy Higgs boson, as it gets heavier in supersymmetry, its coupling to vector bosons goes to zero extremely rapidly. It goes like one over the heavy Higgs mass to the fourth power. So, so very, very rapidly, there's no, no coupling to the Higgs, uh, to the vector bosons. But the coupling's asymptote to one over tangent beta for the heavy Higgs coupling to top quarks or up type quarks and tangent beta to down type quarks. Uh, so the, and, and again, this is the relative coupling compared to the standard model Higgs coupling, right? So what that means is that the heavy, all these heavy searches for uh, heavy Higgs boson searches in supersymmetry that have been done for LHC and Glick and other, other uh, facilities under consideration are predominantly searches involving fermions, involving uh, trying to understand the top, top quark and bottom, and bottom quark final states. Whereas in this scenario, it's entirely into vector bosons because it's like a standard model Higgs, but just with uniformly suppressed couplings. And as, as you go to very, very heavy masses, it really wants to decay to vector bosons dominantly. In the standard model, the top quark is the heaviest mass, that's true, but it never wins in uh, Higgs decay, no matter how heavy the Higgs is. It never wins because the couplings to the vector bosons get quite strong. So it's, so it's the same case here. You can also uh, have this heavy Higgs decay to lighter Higgs. So there's a... Uh, here's one... Uh, benchmark point that does that. Both Higgses are suppressed with respect to the standard model Higgs at equal rates. 
This is unlikely to be the case if the 125 GeV Higgs signal is, is correct. What I just described is very much in the game if a 125 GeV Higgs is, is, is really there. Uh, but, it, but this would not be. So I'll, I will spend a little bit less time on it. I'll just uh, um, show you what would happen. Uh, Higgs could decay into two lighter Higgses. One Higgs can decay into photon and the others into Bs. And you get a signal like this. And with 30 inverse femtobarns, uh, one could see evidence for it at a 14 TeV collider. So that we're still some ways away from it. But you look at the photon-photon the B plus jet invariant mass distribution of this kind of decay chain, where you're only, only tagging one B jet rather than both. OK, so. Uh, so I'll end uh, with, a, with a slide or uh, two slides telling you uh, that the Higgs boson is really special in another way. It's special in so many ways. But another way is that it's accidentally narrow. Uh, if, you, if, if somebody said, oh, oh here's, a, here's a scalar state of mass m, uh, and there's lots of particles in your spectrum, uh, what's, what's the decay width? And you would say, oh, it's m over pi. And you put a little factor in front, and then you have the decay width. And that naive, this, this would be your naive estimate of what, of, of what the width of a scalar boson would be. It would be mh over some phase space type uh, 16 pi. And that's that dashed line up here. Uh, so I'm plotting the, the actual width of the standard model Higgs boson over this sort of naive expected width. And you see this orders of magnitude uh, more narrow when it's light. So 125 GeV is here. It's more than a, it, it's, it's nearly a thousand times more narrow, weakly coupled, than a naive expectation would tell you. That makes the Higgs boson extraordinarily susceptible to new decay modes if they exist. So one source of invisible, one source could be new hidden sector states that couple to the Higgs via this mixing, and then, uh, and then they escape all detection into a hidden world. So that would, that would constitute some small or large branching fraction into invisibly decaying particles, uh, yeah, invisible particles. Uh, the LHC, I'm, I'm just going to flash this because there's no reason to go over it in detail. Uh, the LHC can do well with invisible decay uh, channels, 120 GeV Higgs, entirely invisible, they could see it. Um, but I won't describe why. Uh, and, um, and then also, the Higgs can decay into these new Z prime bosons. If the Z prime boson were just a, a little bit lighter than half mH, it could decay into that. Even if this coupling is small, it could still compete. It might not dominate, but it could still compete. And then once the Z prime is made, it has to decay. So it's on shell, it's made, it just sits there and it's rumbling and says, I need to decay. And the only way it can decay is, is its mixing angle through the Z, and then it can, and the Z can go to leptons. So you can have a four lepton signature of rather light Higgs bosons in this kind of scenario, which is, which is a f fun to contemplate from these hidden worlds. OK, so the conclusion is a Higgs boson is a very unique object that is especially sensitive to new physics. And this new, uh, this new physics comes from its viability entourage, I call it. Supersymmetry, extra dimensions, or, or conformal field theories, whatever you prefer. And that operator of H dagger H being a relevant gauge invariant, Lorentz invariant operator is, is really what gave us this, this inroad to the, to the phenomenology gave us this opportunity to, uh, uh, to pursue it. So collider physics alterations can show up at low energies, uh, so Higgs decay to four leptons even, um, and or at much higher energies, which I think is more likely. And that is somewhat heavier Higgs bosons, which are mixed weakly with the standard model Higgs boson from some hidden world. And if there's dozens and dozens of hidden worlds, why not have one that uh, gets a VEV and mixes like this. And then with lots and lots of data collecting, it slowly will show up, little bumps and peaks at very high energy in lepton neutrino jet jet, for example. 
Okay, thank you. So, questions? Well, you mentioned the new Higgs has to get a BEV as well as the, as the Sanamole Higgs. Will that uh, BEV uh, contribute to the masses of the C boson or the W bosons? Uh, no, it doesn't. And um, <clears throat> they're, they're only very indirectly. So, so directly it doesn't because uh, the symmetry that it's breaking is not the standard model symmetry. So it's, a, it's some other... It's carrying... When you think of something getting a VEV, you should think of uh, quantum numbers being carried into the vacuum. That's one, one sort of way to think about it. And uh, this VEV of this exotic field is carrying other quantum numbers into the vacuum, but not the standard model quantum numbers. So it can't give it a VEV. And that's the reason why, without even, without even looking at this matrix, we know that, um, uh, that, the, that there will be a massless photon state it's for the same reason. You just don't carry uh, electric charge into the vacuum with any of these VEVs, so, so for sure it was safe. But indirectly it affects it because of, because of these off diagonal terms and then, and then going to the mass eigenstate from the weak eigenstate, and then at level repulses a bit. So, so indirectly it has an effect, but not directly. Any more questions? Okay, then. Well, let's thank James Gens for his elegant and insightful lectures. <laughs>